Who wakes up in the evening when Sia cries? You want me to take that one? Yeah, go on. You were just sleeping. It's so easy to become a personal trainer. And your grandma could become a personal trainer if, if she wanted to. You know, back then you just have to do a weekend course and you become a PT. Mm -hmm. Another problem with the fitness industry is I don't think it's, a, it's, it's treated as a respected industry. They'll come to me and be like, so I've been thinking, I think we should do it like this, this, this. And I'm like, that's just what I said a week ago to you. And then I'm like, right, you can take credit for the idea, it's fine. You do take credit for a lot of my ideas. In my head right now, it's just more and better. I'm not, you know, I'm not sitting here thinking I want to quit my job. I want to, yeah, you know, find a partner or whatever. There's other things. Have you? <laughs> Same one. You do so much. Like yeah. you are an incredible dad. Like I did both feel very lucky and blessed me and Sia to have you because you do so much. There's never been a time where I thought, okay, you're not giving enough to us. Like that's always been ticked off. Just recorded a podcast with uh, Chani, my wife. Um, we have discussed all things fitness, business, baby, traveling. Uh, we had about 12, 13 different questions that were submitted by the team. Uh, and in this hour that we snuck in uh, in between one of Sia's naps or during one of Sia's naps, uh, we covered them all. Uh, we covered a wide range of topics. And the last time Chani came on the podcast was about a year ago when we were, I think it was, uh, she was eight, eight months pregnant. So. Uh, this is now 10 months after Sia is born, so yeah, very excited for you to listen. Without further ado, let's dive in. Okay, so we're here in Koh Samui, and we've got a tropical podcast uh, in store for you. Um, <laughs> uh, we last recorded a podcast, I think, literally exactly a year ago, uh, pretty yeah. much. Right here, a few, t few days here and there. Um, and that was when you were uh, six weeks away from due date, I think six yeah. or seven weeks away from due date, so yeah. very heavily pregnant. Uh, but we recorded a podcast all like all the myths around pregnancy that we discovered. And I thought a year later, it'd be really cool as we're almost two months into a three month travel trip with, with Sia, which is what we discussed last time actually, yeah. about wanting to do that. I thought it'd be cool to record a podcast on some of the learnings we've had uh, with, with traveling with a baby, uh, with keeping up with fitness, with business, with work, um, and just, just in general, how, how it's all been. So instead of us um, trying to come up with the agenda, uh, we actually put it to the team to individually curate uh, a bunch of different questions for us to answer. So I've got them all here on, on the phone. So I'm gonna uh, open, up a, open up a question to, the, to, to us both, uh, see where it takes us, and then, yeah, let's, uh, let's dive in. So first question is, who wakes up in the evening when Sia cries? You want me to take that one? Yeah, go on. <laughs> so I tend to wake up. Um, so the, obviously at the beginning, she was waking up way more frequently. Um, for now, touch wood, she doesn't wake up um, as often at all. But every time she does wake up in the night, it's past bedtime, that's when I tend to get up. But the reason for it is I obviously being on maternity, I'm not working a full shift, full working shift like you are. So I much prefer me getting up and also she needs a feed. Um, if it's a nappy, it's a nappy, but it's me doing all of that. And there's not much you can potentially help with. Um, so I'd rather just get on with it at night, keep you sleeping um, and, and that works for me. That worked for us, didn't it, when we were doing that? Yeah, I think we just had an, uh, a discussion about it at the beginning. Yeah. And especially when she was breastfeeding every two to three hours. Yeah. Like this point has been being up. I think for the first week or two, I was getting up. Yeah. And uh, with you, out of guilt, I was like, oh, I just want to, you know, but then I realized, quickly realized, once the adrenaline worn off yeah. uh, of having a newborn, you realize you're just making yourself more tired. And then if both of you are exhausted, it doesn't really make for a productive day in any yeah. way. So I think we just got, came to the agreement, especially because you're breastfeeding, there's not much I can do. So I can't really feed Sia. She wasn't taking, she wasn't taking express milk from a bottle either. Mm. But because of that, it was like, okay, well, you're, you're gonna be the one who gets up in the night. Yeah, but what's nuts is that when she does wake up at 1 a.m. or 2 a.m., this is back in the day when she was like less than five months old and she slept in our room, you wouldn't, you were just sleeping. I don't know how you do it. You slept through her kind of shuffling around or crying or me turning the light on like our little lamp to breastfeed her. You were literally just like snoring away in the corner or just like sleeping away. And I'm like, oh, this guy is like really rested and he's doing well. But um, yeah, we had that discussion. And I've spoken to a few mums about this because I, I, a few mums say that they want their partner to wake up in the night and do the night shift. and. I never really saw the point of it because I'm just there like, well, he's working. He has to be up a certain time, work and then come back. Whereas I can nap when Sia naps in the day. That's what I used to do. Um, I can get my rest in. I can get the help or support that I need if, if you know, if it's available. Um, whereas you would just had to be on it with meetings, with work, with, you know, all the stuff that you were doing in the day. So I much preferred just doing the night shift. It made sense, right? 
But I, I still don't understand how some some guys do do it in the night and how, how that works. Maybe it's because, see, I didn't take the bottle. Yeah. Um, so there's not much that you could do in the night, right? Yeah, I think those who do do it, it's probably a, a element of using the bottle. Yeah, it must be. Um, must I can't be. think of any other reason why, yeah. why it would be the case, especially when they're young, when they need food in the middle of the night. Yeah. Unless they just want to... They just want to get up. Ship in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, mean, I had that guilt at the beginning um, of like, oh, I should be involved at night. But then I just didn't see the point. So I quickly got over it. I remember you actually did sometimes wake up and be like, are you okay? Is everything okay? And I'm like, yeah, everything's fine. And you always asked as well. You always asked, like in the middle of the night, something, if I was feeding her, you'd always like, do you need anything? Should I get you food? Should I get, you know, you, it was really nice. And then there was a point where I'm like, just sleep. Yeah. Like yeah. I remember I said to you, just sleep, don't get up, just rest. So, yeah. No, 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 I've got up since. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next question is, do you ever disagree? I mean, we'll get, what we'll do is we'll, we can either take two as we can now cover all like, we can do it by a theme or we can kind of bounce oh, around. You like you. But I quite like the choose. idea of bouncing around here. So uh, do you ever disagree on how to manage the business? Yeah, so I'd start that off with me and you think very differently. And I think that's why we make a good team. And obviously you started off the business, I joined the business and we have very different skill sets. We've discussed this in kind of previous podcasts. And in terms of disagreement, I think it's more that there's certain things that you see that I don't see, and there's certain things that I see that you don't see. And when we talk about it, it's like, okay, this is the direction. So you're very much the big thinker. You think, right, in five years, 10 years, this is what's gonna happen. This is what we wanna do. This is, this is how, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I'm just there like, but how are we gonna do that? We're gonna need to do this. We're gonna need to hire more people, or, you know, whatever the case is. And I'm there trying to figure out how to do it. And there's so many ideas that you have that sometimes I'm like, right, no, 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 potentially, yeah, no. And then it's like, when does it happen? So it's in terms of, I think it's, a, we disagree, but it's more how to get there and maybe the time isn't right as opposed to, you know, but some of the ideas I must say, they just don't work at all. Yeah, yeah. Some of the ideas are just too far-fetched and we're just like, right, we can't do that at all. But yeah, I just have to kind of reel you in a little bit. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, the way I, the way I think is, probably too much in the future sometimes. Yeah. And I think I, my patience for today is often very limited. I want things done like yesterday. I think we should implement new ideas straight away. But I think I've learned over time to sort of, sort of harness that skill set. Mm. Someone said to me, um, you want to shift from like that innovator energy of just always coming up with ideas, which is great at the starting phase and shift to a more like mechanical way of, of crafting a business. And it's like, it's, it kind of goes against what I, I like doing, um, but I think it's a necessary, necessary evil to sort of get better at. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to harness that energy a bit more. Yeah. And I think I'm getting better at it, but at the same time, I can't shut that, shut that type of, that, that part of my brain off. And I think that's part of, I think you need that spark in every business, otherwise it can quickly deteriorate, but also just get boring. Yeah. So I think for me, it keeps it fun. I've just got to find ways of making it fun without causing distractions. Yeah, but for me, being more of like an operator style, when you tell me all of these ideas, I'm just yeah, there yeah. like, I can't even think that far ahead. Like, it's just beyond me. And I know um, certain team members' personalities are similar to mine. And I'm just there, like, trying to ask you, okay, don't, don't go and tell them that all these things that are going to happen, because they're not, they might happen in five years, 10 years, two yeah. years. So it's just, I'm trying to be like the barrier between... Okay, what do we want to what do we want to actually share and make happen now? Then go and do it. Versus, I'm thinking of all these things and then sharing it with everyone. So it's just kind of keeping it at bay and reeling yeah, it in. Yeah. Well, I think it's good that most of the team are um, are probably more thinking the way you think. Yeah. I think it'd be chaos if it was everyone like you. Everyone was thinking like me. If I, it wouldn't work at all. Yeah. Um, and, that, and that's probably that's probably not by accident either, because I think it works well having uh, opposite energies uh, yeah. in the business. Yeah. So yeah, you put different ways of thinking. He said different ways of thinking. Um, yeah, I, I had something here around like getting easily carried away with ideas, but getting, getting them all shut down. But I think we've, we've covered that. I definitely shut down a lot. So yeah, it's not yeah. really disagreement, but it's like, right, we cannot do that. It, that does not make sense. And then we talk about why, and then it's like, oh, well, you know, it's just a discussion. And then we see each other's points of view, and then it's like, right, let's just uh, nip that in the bud. Yeah. The good thing is, at the end, we always, we do a line. Yeah, um, yeah, But it always. usually just takes, you, me presenting an idea, you shutting it down, and then me coming around to it in a few days or week, and then being like, oh yeah, I've come up with this idea, and it's basically what you said to me. Yeah. And I'm trying to take the credit. That happens, you've heard it here, that happens a lot when he has an idea, and he says, right, this is what I want to do, and I'm just there like, well, that's not going to work. In my head, I'm thinking it through logically, I'm a very logical thinker, and then I say, okay, well, this can work instead, and then he'll shut that down. And then a week later, he'll come to me and be like, 
so I've been thinking, I think we should do it like this, this, this. And I'm like, that's just what I said a week ago to you. And then I'm like, right, you can take credit for the idea, it's fine. No. You do take credit for a lot of my ideas. You heard this first, you heard this here. You take a lot of credit, what do, do you not think? Well, someone's got to say the idea, right? Uh, I just adapt the idea. <laughs> what is your ultimate vision for RNT over the next 10 years? So there's probably more one for me, but you can, you go. You can start first. No, no, you can start and then I can kind of see what you say and then I can take it to the next level. Okay, so I think uh, for, for me, RNT, I see it as like um, making a huge impact, even more so than we have done. I really see that it's um, going to be a game changer for people. I want to impact more people around the world, make ourselves more kind of visible and in front of people who need our help. Um, and support. Um, so I feel like that's one thing, impact. But then I think there's another element of um, impacting, not just through coaching, but how we as a company can give back to like the younger generations. There's always something I've wanted to do with like children and you know something along that line. So it doesn't need to, it could be just basic stuff like nutrition, education. There's like something, there's like a bigger, bigger idea and impact that we can do. And I think I have yet to figure that out, but I feel like you have more thoughts on it, so. Uh, that's an interesting one. I've not thought about it from an r and perspective that in terms of like giving back. And that, I definitely see ourselves doing it you know, from a personal perspective. How we link r and into it, probably, yeah, probably haven't thought as much of it in that way. Where I see r and is, I think right now we are very much, uh, we're helping, so I, I agree with that in, in expanding our impact. Yeah. I think there's a, a big opportunity there and something I've always thought of for potentially the last three or four years in making the, the five phases the industry standard. I really have this, this like vision long-term of how do we make the, the five phases the industry standard? Because it was born out of a frustration of quick fixes, cookie cutter plans, 12 uh, week shreds and people rebounding and yo-yo dieting and all these things. That's why we, we built it. And if you go through the five phases all, all, all together, you, you will not only get in shape, but you'll completely rewire your brain, your, your, the way you're thinking, your mindset, your behavior, everything changes, you become a new person. And if everyone gets, goes through that journey, it, you know, it, it'll transform so many different layers of society. So on an individual level, but also fam family, community, et cetera. But that's only with, through who we can impact, right? Yeah. So if it became an industry standard where all coaches and trainers who are interested in body composition were delivering the five phases uh, in the way it should be delivered. I think it would it would it would, it would transform um, like countries' healthcare, the way people think about healthcare, the way people um, the, the the sort of resources that we have for healthcare. Because people will just be operating better, they'll be feeling better, they'll be looking better, performing better. Um, so I think about that often. Um, but again, it becomes one of those things where it's so it, it, it's it's quite a big um, it's a big idea. And obviously bringing that to reality of how we execute it, I think obviously has to start with making what we're doing right now, bulletproof and like world-class at every single level, world-class at every single phase. Yeah. Um, the whole product, it has to be world-class before we roll it out even further. But I think that's why I, I keep coming back to that when I think, you know, when I'm in my clouds and <laughs> in, in, the, in that sort of outer space, I always think like, how do we make what we're doing industry standard? And it's basically, going from impacting on a sort of coach to client or company to client relationship to a company to industry relationship. And it's going to that next level that I think uh, the, the future of RNT is, but we've just got to go through certain levels now to get there. But my patient, my, my, in my head, I'm like, hey, we need to get, you know, speed up the years, but that doesn't happen without this bit. Yeah, the hard work needs to be put in now. We need to take our time with it, make sure it's right, iterate the process and then yeah, yeah. Cause each phase is so specifically designed to help someone uh, go from where they are now and especially uh, go, go from where they are now to ultimately someone who never has to worry about dieting or worrying about food, but it does take a lot of work and it does take a lot of expertise to guide, guide people through that journey. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it's building out first for our members and for the way we do it. And then it's seeing how we can roll that out across an industry level. And I think there's such a big impact there that we could have mm. that could, um, yeah, just, just take R&T to the next level. That's very, that, that really excites me, uh, but it's the patience of it that I have to always keep myself uh, patient and thinking of that long-term vision when we're in the day-to-day -day yeah. battle of business. Yeah. Cool. In your opinion, I'll be interested, curious to see what you think of this actually. In your opinion, what is the biggest problem within the fitness industry? That's interesting. All I know is that 
friends, families, other mums that I've spoken to always talk about how they lose weight, then they gain weight, then they lose weight, then they gain weight. And there's so many different ways of doing it that they're kind of dipping and diving into different um, different programs or diets or, you know, whatever it is. And I think one of the... Is it the problem or the challenge with the industry? Uh, problem. Problem is that there isn't one kind of set path, but also that everyone can go on. A, everyone's like, oh, we, you know, four weeks. The quicker the weight loss, the better for them. But actually it's not because so many people lose weight, let's just say in four weeks, like make it tight, the process, and then they just put it back on. And I see that far too much from my friends, families, new friends that I'm making through the mom society. And I think that's an issue. I, I, just, I, I just feel like they, they aren't able to sustainably take it off, take the weight off and then keep it off. And that's so, I see that as a big problem yeah. because you're just constantly in this up and down and it impacts the mind, it impacts them. Like I, I know people who be like, oh, we've just gained like this much. It's fine, all we need to do is just eat half the food we've been eating and go for a run every day. And I'm just there like, there's so much more to yeah. weight loss and getting into shape than just that. Like it's not just cardio it's not just eating half the food you're eating it's eating the right foods it's weight training as well that i've i've i didn't know this one as much um, up until i started rnt like there's so much more to it that isn't shown necessarily in the industry like you just see quick fixes and i think that's an issue yeah so that, that's good to know because you're coming from like an outside perspective yeah. of the industry for me the biggest ones are i, I think um, i've got a few like things i think are wrong with the industry one of the biggest things I think is just the low barrier to entry. Yeah. And I think this has got exasperated since um, COVID. So low barrier to entry before, before COVID, it was so easy to become a personal trainer. Like your, like your grandma could become a personal trainer if, if she wanted to. And you just go, <laughs> you just got to do a weekend. You, you, you know, back then you just had to do a weekend course and you become a PT. Mm. So it's like anyone could become a personal trainer, but then it became even worse when things went online. Now the beauty of online is you have flexibility, you can impact more people. But the con of it is then everyone and their dog becomes uh, an online trainer because all you need to do is open up an email account or an Instagram account and call yourself an online coach. So there's like no, there's no barrier to entry to becoming one. And then what that brings, the, the, the problem that brings to it is then there's no accountability standard. Yeah. And I always think, how is some, how is it, and well, the industry is very young still in the grand scheme of things. It's only really like 20 years, maybe 25, maybe 30, depending on if it's personal training or online. Um, but if you think about industries like the financial world, everything is regulated, everything is uh, you held, you held to account because you're dealing with people's money and you're dealing with people's, well, the money and economy, and it has an impact on the global scale. But it's so surprising that the idea of accountability standards for personal training has not been implemented because we're dealing with people's health. And we can really, and as you mentioned with the quick fixes, if, if you've got someone out there marketing quick fix snake oil or, or whatever it may be, the problem that it does outside of wasting people's money is it messes people up mentally and physically yeah. in that you're, they lose weight, they gain it back, lose weight, gain it back. And we're dealing with people's mental, physical and emotional health. And on those three levels, it needs, there needs to be some sort of regulation or some sort of accountability. Otherwise, we just open ourselves up to effectively a cowboy industry and the wild, wild west. And I, I always have this, like when I think about what I shared earlier around like the long-term vision, I do think in any... Uh, maturation cycle of a business the the cream always rises to the crop and uh, there's a separation between those who are actually in it for helping people and those who are not but at the same time in this in this maturation cycle i think we do need to see um some sort of regulation or accountability brought into brought into it so trainers are held accountable to their advice that they're giving and also to the level that they're giving it at and and that's something that I have some ideas of how it could be done, but it, it requires like, it requires some, some level of government intervention. Um, and I think that's where it gets, it gets tricky because of red tape and uh, just whether they actually care. Because I think another problem with the fitness industry is I don't think it's, a, it's, it's treated as a respected industry. And, and this is probably one of the reasons why. I think when, it's, when you say you're a personal trainer, I still think there's a perception around Oh, you're just doing star jumps in the gym or you're just counting reps in the gym. Yeah. And, and what's interesting is Luis recently asked them a couple of groups, what do you think? What comes to your mind when you think of a personal trainer? And so many different responses came up. Like there was no consistency across the board because you've got, you've got the jack dude who's intimidating. 
one person said they're, they're, they're muscular and sexy and they're attractive. And I was like, that's interesting. One person says they, they can change your life. They can guide you towards doing that. Another person says, you know, they're overweight and they don't really care about what you're doing. So there's like, there's so many different perceptions mm. uh, because no one really knows what an actual trainer should be doing. Um, so I think, uh, I think that's what I think is the biggest, that's what I think the biggest problem with the industry is, is a low barrier to entry and then a lack of accountability to, to the standards. And I think that's why the personal training industry um, is not respected in the way it should, because what we do is life-changing. What a personal trainer can do for someone is, is, is life-changing. Uh, and that, that's why it's not being um, respected. And I think one thing um, we're talking about the future, that I love for the for, for R&T, but also just as an industry, is that trainers are, there is a career path generally for trainers. They're treated like uh, the respected professionals that they are, and they have somewhere to go once they're trained, once they're qualified, and they know what they know what they need to do in order to build their career. Because right now, the trainers are expected to be um, most trainers are expected to be business owners, or they're expected to be entrepreneurs, and they're not. And then they're not. Right? And it's like the engineer. If you're an engineer, you you are an engineer. It's like if you qualify as an engineer and you're suddenly expected to do marketing, do mark, do sales, and all these things. It doesn't quite make sense because an engineer is an amazing engineer. Yeah. And I think the same thing needs to happen with trainers. And there are some places that are helping trainers do that, and RNT being one of them. But for the most part, they're not. And they're just sort of put out there and it, it's, they expect to somehow make a, make a living out of it. And that's why I think there's such a high turnover with the industry as well, where people come in, they do it for one or two years, three years, and then they're gone. Uh, because it's so hard. And, and there's a lack of stability, there's a lack of security, uh, and there's just a lack of a genuine career the people that aren't in the game for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, like, a, like an engineer might be. Yeah. So you've got a lot of problems. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else on, on, the, on the problems before we move on to the next one? I think that's everything for me. Yeah. Okay. Um, what job would you choose if money was not a concern? I'll let you go first. I was thinking about that. What would I go for? Um, so I think there's two parts to it for me. One would be, one would be um, probably some element of setting up a foundation or giving back in some way. Mainly the, the area I would target would be uh, teenagers or young people in underprivileged areas who have an entrepreneurial spirit, uh, but they don't have the access to funding or mentoring or support required to bring their idea to life. I always think that the, the next Steve Jobs um, could be anywhere, but it could be the most likely to be in areas where they just can't be the next Steve Jobs because they don't have the environment they're in. Mm. And I think I, like, I would love to be able to create an ecosystem where people who are dis in disadvantaged areas who don't have access to it can, can, can bring their ideas to life because that, that could be, you know, that could be yeah, life changing for not only them, but their families and their communities. Mm. So that's one thing. Um, and that's why, by the way, I like working with I Can, You Can Too, because they're doing something on a similar sort of level. Um, albeit not for, for entrepreneurial thinking, but... Well, some of them, we yeah, met some of the, well, yeah, some of the kids there. They were very, like, I was very impressed. Yeah, yeah that's true. Entrepreneurial, you were working with one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You kept in touch. Well, that's a great he example. Was, he was hustling. He was really, yeah, yeah. really entrepreneurial. Well, that's a great example of someone who, who was trying that way. So, yeah. yeah, that comes to mind as one. And I think I put down... Um, a little quote here, it was like, teach a child on their field of village. Yeah. It's an African proverb. And I think that's exactly what I would get at with that, yeah. with that move. I like that. So that would be one. And, and on that idea would be creating like a shared fund around it. So rather than just being sort of me, it'd be a shared fund that we'd build where people can invest into people, can invest into ideas. And, and then um, they see the fruits of their labor or their investment in people who then take that investment and do something amazing. So that would be like one idea if money wasn't an object. But I didn't see that happening. I didn't see that, um, so not that I didn't see it happening. I didn't see that not happening yeah. in the next five, 10 years, uh, regardless that of that. Up. I think the second thing would be um, if money wasn't an object, I think what I love doing most is, is just helping um, just helping early stage businesses. Yeah. I think like that comes really naturally to me. I can look at businesses and know exactly what they need to do to grow. And I think I can do it way better for other people than I can do for um, that I can do with myself sometimes because what happens with my own when it's my own business I get too overwhelmed with too many different ideas yeah. then I get stuck right um, whereas with, with other people I can immediately look at what they're doing 
all their different numbers, all the different ideas that they're doing and just be like, yeah, this is what you need to do, this is what you need to do. And it's happened so many times where I'll give people advice in that, in that setting just from a conversational manner. And they'll report back and be like, yeah, implement it all and this will happen. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. And that really excites me. And that, those are the conversations I get most energized by. So I think being like an advisor or um, just a non-exec on, on multiple boards would be sort of my future like dream job. So something that's coming soon or what? <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, just have to see. I think, again, I always like think, um, I, I think that will be the future. I just don't know when. Does that mean that lawyer is definitely out? Yeah, I would, I would never go. I would never. I did, I'd never do law or, or anything like that. Uh, I would never return to the gym. Um, I think that phase of my life is over. Fair. So, yeah, those would be the two things I do. And, and the good thing is about the both of them is, I don't think it. I don't see myself not doing them. Like I, I can already picture it happening. Yeah. I just need to get well, go through the process of getting there. Yeah. Well, I like that. For myself. Um, so obviously having coming from a corporate background, um, that's something I don't think I could go back to. Like I loved being an engineer, but there's a reason I stopped like that, that career path. And obviously now I've had SIA and I've worked with or spoken to a lot of um, women and young girls. And I just feel like there's such a, 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 there can be a gap there and they go through their own challenges with mindset, health, everything. And I feel so strongly about helping women excel and women to be feel feel empowered within themselves. I don't know what the job would be per se, but it's something around supporting, guiding, helping. You talked about foundation. Like I'd love to do something for young girls because that's where, you know, I look at the younger generations and they're so focused on what they're seeing on social media or their looks mm. or hair. You know, I, I didn't even own makeup until I think I was 20. Like there's so many, I think I just grew up like with, I had oil in my hair, plaits, and I didn't even care. Like I was just so carefree, running around in the mud. And these days, I, you know, mud outdoors. And these days, I look at um, young girls, and I just think feel like there's so there's so much pressure on them as well, and kids in general. But more so, like I just relate more to the girls because yeah. I think my childhood is so different, and that's why I want Sia to be exposed to things like travel, nature, um, and just for her to feel secure within herself. But I just feel like there's um, challenges with with um, with that area. And I'd love to do something to help, whether that's from a um, charitable perspective, a foundation, something like that. But that's always been at the back of my mind. And I love working and seeing and nourishing and looking at girls and young young kids grow. So it's so nice we've got Sia, because I can almost like, yeah, yeah, have that like, yeah like I just I just love seeing her grow and letting her run free and be independent and just do her own thing yeah you're saying as though she's already running around being independent she is independent like she just plays now without us and uh, sometimes I'm like do you not want to hang out with me and she's like just playing in the corner by yeah, herself yeah. I'm like, oh. I saw something the other day of like um, a cigarette packet and on a cigarette packet it had the word TikTok on it oh. and um, it says something like uh, underneath the, the pe- it, was, it was it was a parent who wrote about kids and saying uh, we'll look back at this age and we, we would be, we're going to be shocked that we let our kids near social media and TikTok because of, of the, yeah, the perception that it leads to. Yeah. You, know, it's, we, you know, we see kids like at eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, and they're like Snapchatting their kids. And I don't know if that's the new thing. Like that might be the, that might be the norm. And people, parents who are listening to this with kids that age might be like, yeah, guys, just wait till you get there. Yeah, of course, of course. It is like, it's so different because we just didn't have that then. And we just don't know that because it's still so new, we don't know the impact it's going to have. So I think it's like, and the thing is with parenting is that, as we already know, it's like there's no, there's no right or wrong blueprint. And we're not going to know if what we're doing is right until like 20 years, 30 years. What is time. right as and well? We yeah, like, what, what is, is right? right? So like, all we can do is, you know, embody the, ver- the, the values that we want to give on. Exactly. And, not sh- and work on our vices so they don't pick those up because we do know that that role modeling is, is massive. Yeah. Uh, pick, uh, kids will pick up the, the good stuff, but they also pick up the bad stuff because they don't know the difference. Yeah, like, you know, you hear all these things as, as new parents as well, no screens, no this, no that. And I just think, I, I just don't want to judge any other parents because we don't know until we go through that ourselves. Yeah. So it's just, we do what we think is right. There We've is been trying, a right was it, the three S's, was it? Uh, sugar. Sugar, salt, screens. Sugar, salt, screens, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sugar, that's what we salt, been trying to so no sugar, no salt, no sugar. Well, that's easy with the food. I think the screens is the hard part, but we don't watch TV in front of her. We try not to use our phones in front of her, but at the same time, 
I feel like I don't want her to be like when she does see it for the first time. Oh my god, this is brand new. So it's almost like introducing it in a yeah. slow. And I can't see the benefit of a ten month old watching a screen though. No, I, I mean, she, she, to be honest, like sometimes when she sees a screen out and about, if we're out and there's a like a yeah. a board or something with a screen, she's not even interested. Like in the on the plane when there were TVs next to her, she's just not interested in it anyway. So she just wants to play with a toy. She just, just loves her toys, isn't she? Cool. Next question. Uh, what are your top three tips for traveling with a baby? This one comes up a lot in like, the DMs and stuff. Yeah. So go for it. Um, I'd say firstly, be flexible. This is a hard one for me because I'm very scheduled. Like I like a routine and she has a, and Sia has a routine. So when, when she's off routine, I'm off routine. The day just kind of goes a bit merged. Yeah, we should have and... seen Channing before this podcast being recorded. What, what do you Absolute mean? Absolute chaos. What? <laughs> Stressed out about the nap, stressed out. Oh, because she's she has napping at the moment, and I'm just like, right, she's going to be up at this time. We need to be done by this time because then we're leaving after this time. So, but yeah, I, I'm just very regimented in that respect. So for me to be flexible, it's it's very out of my comfort zone, let's say. So, um, but I'm learning to do that because when you're on a plane and the plane, how many planes have been delayed? I'm there trying to plan a flight time based on her nap, but next thing you know, the plane's delayed two hours, and I'm like. Well, there goes that nap. Well, there goes the plane nap that we were going to have. So things can change so quickly. Um, and yet she's way more flexible flexible and adaptable than we are. Like yeah, she yeah. just gets on with it, sleeps when she wants to, even if we're out and about. Um, so that's probably one. Be flexible and remain calm because anything can happen and things will change. I think the second one is uh, tips for traveling with a baby is prepare. Preparation is huge. So before we go anywhere, we look at, okay, what are the roads like? What do we need to take? Do we need like, oh, I, I just remember everything. I like to make a list of everything. Um, even any day trips that we do here, I just think, right, do we need to take a high chair, a portable high chair? And preparation is so key. Um, there's certain things that we're not able to do because of the long days or the nature of the environments that we go to is just not suitable for her. Um, so we always put her first, right? We always put her first and say, right, we're not going to do that. If it means we, it means that we're going to have a good time, but she's not it's not a good time because we're not going to have a good time. She's not happy. Um, so that's probably another one. Preparation is so, so, so key. Um, I can't think of a third one. Patience. Oh, massive yeah. patience. That's the big one. I think the big thing is that you got to realize you're not number one anymore. Yeah. Like you just, you're just not the, you're not the most important person in the room anymore. So I think that takes a big, that's probably the biggest thing I've learned as a new dad is your ego has to take a massive, you, you just destroy your own ego because you're just not the most important. Probably not only for yourself, but also your wife doesn't think you're the most important either. <laughs> so like, all of a sudden, they're most focused on the baby. So you, you have to remember that you're not the most important person um, and they are. So everything you do has to be around them. Yeah. So it will, it does include a bit of sacrifice. Like you might not be able to go out to the late night bars. If that, not, not that you even do that, but it's just an example that we personally have preferred to keep Sia on a seven to seven sleep routine. Mm -hmm. But that means we can't go out in the evenings. Uh, and that's just the- But what it does mean is we don't go out in the evenings, but what it does mean is touch wood, we don't wake up in the night. We yeah, have yeah. a good night's sleep because she's rested. She sleeps yeah. in the night and we sleep in the night. Whereas if we're putting her to bed at 10 o'clock, she might wake up, her routine's gone, then the next day we suffer. So I'm quite- uh, or, or it might be that she sleeps 10 till 10 without waking up. Yeah. But then the the the, there's just pros and cons, right? That means we've got to then be out with her or yeah. up with her. And then by the time you get to sleep, it's like midnight. So we just chose that way. I mean, there's no right or wrong. We just no. chose that way. And uh, yeah, it just means there's some things you can't do. Like for example, we, we, I think we were joking that I think it was the first time I've been out because your, parent, your, parent, your parents oh, are yeah. here. First time I've been out after 6 p.m. in about three months. Yeah. Um, when we went out for You're like, oh my God, it's dinner. evening, it's dark. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's another one. Um, the, the key thing to remember is you're just not going to be number one anymore. So the way you travel is different, but it's just a different experience now. You've had your, you had your, your solo days, single days of traveling, you had your partner days of traveling, and then you've got your, your family days of traveling. This is it's a whole new experience of travel. Like people who are expecting to have their key, cake and eat it too. So if you're going out with your kids and you're like, right, I want to stay out till midnight. I want to go to the club. I want to do this. I want to do that. Something's going to give. And then you just got to think, right, what do I want to prioritize? And we've agreed as a family slash as us, that we just want to make sure she's comfortable, she's happy, and we'll then base things around her. So there's certain things we haven't done, like certain, when we were in Mexico, we didn't do Chichen Itza. We agreed, okay, it's going to take two and a half hours to get there in a car. She'll hate that journey. She'll hate the journey back. Everything, there's no shade. It's just not the best 
environment for her. So we decided not to do that um, as a two. I would have loved to have gone, but that's just for another day when she's older. And you've got to think it's all temporary, like enjoy the time you have now. Like if Sia just wants to go and have fun on the beach and we want to do something else, we'd rather do that and we'll just do that with her. We just adapt to that. But patience is huge because she also um, changes her changes daily, right? Like nowadays she's eating for 45 minutes to an hour and we're just sat there like eating with her. And um, whereas before she was done in 10, 15 minutes. So it, it, things change, so you yeah. just gotta be really patient. Yeah, I mean, someone who uh, is very, I like to have been, uh, I always pride myself on structure before CEO was born, but I think at least the last year, just, it's just been out of the window. Cause in my head, I'm like, <laughs> any structure I set will be done in the next two weeks. So I've just got to create, it's just like a really fluid routine. Yeah. And I think I've just changed the way I work and operate um, compared to how I used to be like, plan everything for the half an hour. Whereas now it's more just like, you just get these things done in the day, these things done in the week, and then just be flexible along the way. Yeah. Um, where do you see them, or where do they see themselves? This was uh, written in the third person. Where do you see yourselves personally in 10 to 20 years? Personally in 10 to 20 years, um, I'd see myself um, with a slightly bigger family, potentially touch wood, obviously that, that happens. I'd love to have a, another, another little one. Um, so with the ex expanded family, hopefully a business that's um, impacting bigger than we are. So like work's covered. And I think it's just continuing with our, as we are right now, traveling. I'd love to see more and more of the world and let our children explore more and more of the world and experience that. Because the more they're exposed to different environments, cultures, food, everything, I feel like it just helps them grow and develop and think differently. It's like a different mindset when you're out seeing things. And I've been traveling since I was 20 and I feel like that's what's helped me be open-minded, understanding and just learn. It's such a learning. And it also helps me as a self-development tool as well for me. Um, so yeah, something along the lines of that. Yeah, I think for me, it's just more and better. Just yeah. think, uh, I've worked really hard in the last seven years or so to build a life that is in line with my values and aligned with the way I want to live, like a life by design. And well, it's probably been long, going on longer than seven years, but it's just, it's just about continually optimizing that. So it's just about building my life around physical health, growth and freedom, those three things. Mm -hmm. If as long as I'm optimized around those three values, then everything will just come, come with it. So more and better is what I think of is, you know, it's being able to still train really, really hard in my forties and fifties, which is where 10 to 20 years will be, which is quite weird yeah. saying it. Uh, so still being able to train really hard, still being able to um, build and grow businesses. Maybe I'll be doing the things I mentioned earlier in the podcast. Um, and the third thing would just be like distilling those values across to, to see her and, you know, like you said, hopefully another one as well. Um, and continue to work on my own vices. So, you know, I can pass on hopefully the, what I perceive to be the good things uh, along to, to our children and then just enjoying that, that learning experience along the way. So yeah, for me, it's just more and better rather than like drastic new things. But then you never know what, what, what's gonna happen. You never know what will come up in, like 15 months ago, I never, I never, I never knew I'd be doing my Thai obsessively like I am now. <laughs> so you just don't know what new thing might come in the way, but in my head right now, it's just more and better. I'm not, you know, I'm not sitting here thinking, I wanna quit my job, I wanna, yeah. you know, find a partner or whatever those other things have you. <laughs> Say what now? <laughs> uh, other things that, that are sort of typical answers here. It's more just a case of like, how do we just crank the optimizer dial here? Yeah. So we're continuing to staying true to what we want uh, rather than sort of following the, the natural path that you just- The traditional path. Yeah, the traditional path of like, you get married, you do this, you do that. And then you at 50, you do this, 60, you do that. And I think what we've always done well or what I, th what I think I personally have done well is is just done doing what I want to do yeah. um, and trying to follow that path. Uh, I think ever since I told my parents I don't want to do law, it's always been yeah. a case of like, how do I just pack off my own path out here? And and just follow that and just try and, it's, it's hard, but it's just it's just about following what you want to do. Yeah, and, and just not getting distracted. Yeah, but I feel like you're right in that. Like we're very aligned in the direction that we want to go in. But you're right, I don't have like in 10 years time, I'm, I'm going to do this or something like that. I feel like we're quite, I say live for the moment, but short term as well. Like we know, okay, well this year we want to travel here. We want to do this. We want to go here. We want to uh, do this. I think one thing I can think about is like, I can think really far in the future, but the problem is the world is changing so rapidly. That's true. And that's probably why I've stopped thinking so far in the future because I used to be like, all right, in 2030, we're going to do this. 2035, we'll do this. Reality is we don't know what's going to happen in the next three years. Like the world is changing so quickly. I think 
after three years, it doesn't really make sense to, to be thinking too far out. Um, I think then you just get overwhelmed, get anxious. And then on a six to 18 month basis where you want to be, I'd say, I'd say focused on more because in three years time, things can change a lot. So yeah, yeah we just may, yeah, for example, like where do you want to live? It's like a big question that I'm thinking about a lot right now. Is we're because, thinking about that. Mm. Yeah, where, where do we want to, where do we want to live in the next 10 years? We don't know that yet. We don't know the answer to that. And that's such a key part of, of life. It's like, I always think the three big questions are like, who do you want to be with? What do you want to do? And where do you want to live? I think I've got that from reading Naval's book. So those are the three most important decisions you can make. And the big one of like, where do you want to live is like up for grabs at the moment. A year ago, I never even thought that it was out. Like I was so set on it being Ealing in London, West London. Whereas now we spent the last, out of the last, by the end of, by the start of April, we would have spent four months out of five and a half outside of London. That's true, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and it makes me think, you know, is it, is it London anymore? And I don't know, I find it difficult to think in 10 years that we will be, we will be spending more than a few months in London because whether... I just think, as a system, it's just, oh, yeah, it's just yeah. not going, it's not going in the right direction. But so. that, yeah. I, I think it helps that you're very open-minded with these things, and so am I. So we're just, we kind of encourage each other on. Like, he'll, he'll give an idea for, the, you know, this idea of where do you want to live. And I'm like, well, London, where else? Yeah. And then you almost like be like, okay, well, let's think a bit differently. And yeah. then you open my mind to it. And when I have an idea and you're just like, well, this, of course. And I'm like, oh, well, actually, have you thought about this, this, this? And that's when we kind of go explore think about things, talk it through. And um, so I like that we're very, we can be very aligned on it and we're open-minded. I think with the London thing, it was like, for me, it was a case of, we know the family, we want to grow the family. What we're staying in now isn't sustainable because it's too small. Yeah. So do we want the, do you want the house with the mortgage? <laughs> would we, you know, would we want to wait before we made that plunge? Because once you get the house with the mortgage. You're tied down You're pretty tied down for a while, aren't you? Then you've, then you've sort of agreed where you're going to stay for a while. Yeah. So I think that was what prompted this, this discussion. Yeah. So I think that's a, that, that wraps up that question nicely. Uh, how were you managing your time, especially with training and meal prepping whilst running a business and having a baby? I'll, I'll go for that because I, I, my, from my personal life, my training has taken a hit. I still do all my steps. That's the easy part. Like I love being out, walking around with Sia. That's easy. What I would say is my training, which I used to do comfortably in my own time, in my own headspace and not think about anything, has taken a hit. So this year I'm trying to get that back on track. I'm obviously, I'm 10 months now, um, well, postpartum slash um, into, into having a baby. And it's getting easier because things are becoming a bit more um, predictable in terms of timings. But even then, like now when we're here together, who's going to, if she has napping, okay, I have this much time, but then I need to go, come back. Like it's so much easier having a gym at your doorstep, like literally in the building you're staying in, which we did in Dubai, that really helps. And that's taken a hit. But everything else has been very manageable. But I would say that we've, outside of being away, we've had a lot of help at home. So we've got your parents who are super helpful. Like they literally just do everything to support us, support me as well um, with looking after Sia. So that's helped me with meals, nutrition, everything. Um, and even in terms of business or work, obviously I'm on, I was on maternity. And that, what that means for a lot of women is no work, yeah. right? You don't work, you just look after your baby. But the nature of um, running a business with you is, I might not be in a meeting, but I'm still, we're still discussing business um, often, right? Often enough. I know exactly what's going on in the day-to-day. -day. I check the Slack, company Slack, so I know exactly what's going on daily. Um, and where they're discussing ideas, strategy, mapping things out. So in terms of direction, and I'm helping Mike be like, right, this is the direction. It might not be as hands-on as I was, but that's still at the back of my mind. I'm like doing this podcast here now, and it just feels like um, that's something that I really enjoy doing as well as being a mum. It's just kind of fitting that in, which I feel like we do well, whether it's evenings, naps, etc. But as I said, I think the key thing that's taken a hit is my training. It's not been as good. How about you? Because you juggle a lot. Uh, I think I think I'm still um, I think I'm still managing all three really well the yeah. training being a dad and, and running a business but I think it's just the constant pull of priorities mm. like I'm always feeling I'm always feeling like I'm not giving enough to either of them that's what I'm always thinking like oh I could be training more because I used to train like this or I could be working more because I used to work like this or I could be seeing more because I've been doing too much work or I've been doing too much training so there's just always like battle in my head of like Am I doing enough in each area? So that's why I think about often, 
but then I just have to make sure I set, I just need to know what needs my time the most at the moment. So I'd say training, I've just, the last six months, I've probably just put on maintenance. And what that means is doing a minimum of three to four sessions a week, whereas it used to be like six sessions, six sessions a week, seven sessions a week, because I just used to love it. Whereas now, as much as I still love it, it's just well, something it needs to give. So for me, it was, all right, I can't train as much as I used to, because I want to, one of my goals this year is to not have a goal. Yeah. And because of not having a goal, which is harder than I thought. You know, every now and then I'd be like, oh, you think I should do a fight again? Or yeah. you think I should do a marathon again? Um, because I don't have a goal, there's no reason for me to train that much. So I just put on maintenance and just try to have fun with it. So that's the way I'm approaching my training is like, just have fun with it. That already takes away stress because I'm not trying to get ready for something. That takes away time, takes away emotional and time stress. And then with business, it's like, I've just got to do what needs to be done there. Um, and the nature is, I work very differently now than I used to. I used to like waking up, going straight to work, working all through the morning, um, and then I'll catch up with you at lunch and then at dinner. Whereas now it's, it's very different because depending on what time I wake up, I might do a little bit in the morning, but most of the time I'm with you and Sia until about nine. Then I'll work, then I'll be back for lunch. But then I'm also trying to make bath time. So I've just, I've reduced my working hours, I'd say. Um, but not at the expense of anything. Yeah. So I've just had to be more effective. So yeah, I'd say it's just a constant pull of priorities. You never feel like there's nothing to be doing, nothing to be doing. Yeah. Is that a fair answer? Yeah, I mean, I think you balance it really well. Like you always check in with me sometimes and say, have I done, have I given enough here? Or is there more I can do here? And I'm thinking, no, you do so much. Like yeah. you are an incredible dad. Like I did, I feel really, we feel, both feel very lucky and blessed me and Sia to have you because you do so much. Like you make the food, you clean up, you do, you look after her when I need time, you take her for an hour, you, you're always offering, okay, well, why don't you go train and I'll look her out for, after her for an hour or whatever the time is. And it's so nice that you do that. So I feel very appreciative of everything that you do. There's never been a time where I thought, okay, you're not giving enough to us. Like that's always been ticked off. Um, not that I have much expectation as well, because I think a lot of dads tend to be out of the house between eight to six or whatever that time is. Whereas it's just very, we're very lucky that you're around. Um, but when you're working, you're working. So when you're working, I obviously sometimes still disturb you here and there and I'm learning to kind of reel that in because you're just like out there somewhere or you know wherever you are but when you're working you're working and that's it but when you're with us you're with us and you're 100% with us and I really like that so you balance yeah. I think you balance it that's really, really well. hard though that, that is like whilst I like you might think I'm right there but it's still really hard to compartmentalize like that's a real tough thing to do is actually compartmentalize and the only way you can really do it I found is if you do pour everything into the into your work and then you come and um come and be with the family. But if you don't pour everything in and you've just left it at 7%, then you're still thinking about it when you're with your family. And then you're always like, you're never working, you're never resting, you're never, you are, you are working, you're, you're just in between all the time. So that's something that I'm constantly trying to work on because the the changing of schedules and what we're doing with travel, etc. So yeah, I think a juggle of priorities, we're just making sure that you're pouring into each one so you can't compartmentalize. Yeah. Uh, traveling for longer than a holiday, do's and don'ts to keep your goals, keep your goals, no, sorry, keep achieving your goals in work, fitness and life. So go with do's. Have a routine. Yep, we're quick fire on this one. All right, have a routine so you know what you're doing when. Plan in advance, so you plan your day or week in advance. So you know this day I'm gonna do yep. three more tie sessions or whatever it is. Um, get all your food so you don't have to worry about, right, what am I gonna eat when? Just do a big batch of, we do shopping here, so we cook, um, so we know exactly what we're gonna eat. Um, what else? Maybe. For me, uh, find somewhere that has a gym nearby, that'll keep okay. your fitness going. Yeah. Like, that's a no brainer. Like, if you can have a gym 10, more, 10 minute walking distance, you will train more, uh, as opposed to having a 30 minute drive. So that's a big one. And I'd say the other one is, for do's, is no, if you're, if you're working, if you're there longer than holiday, you are, you're still working. So the thing that you need to do is remember that there's a price of admission when you're traveling. So if you're yeah. on, operating on different time zones, like we're now seven hours ahead, you're, you can't escape late night meetings. Like it's impossible to do that. So you have to accept that you will no longer have meetings. So no longer have evenings where you're just chilling out. You'll be spending most of them on a laptop, on a, on a Zoom call, as an example. Uh, and same on vice versa. If you're six, uh, six to eight hours behind, like we were in Mexico, six hours behind, that meant 6 a.m. meetings, yeah. uh, 7 a.m. meetings. So it's a price of admission you have to take. Um, but 
you know, you just flex your days accordingly and you move, you move your schedule around. But just remember that if you are going away longer than a holiday, you can't have your cake and eat it and work eight till four whilst being seven hours ahead and just saying to everyone, oh, I'm, I'm off for the next four months. That doesn't work. Yeah. You have to just go with it and, and know that you, you might, it might not be your idea. You might like going to bed at 8 p.m., but you're probably not. So I'd say that's a big one. Um, don't? Don't um, get too caught up in things. So for example, when me, if I'm like, if you're working, I'm like, I'm just gonna pop out and go to the beach and come back. It's not like, you're like, oh, you know what? I'm just gonna leave all my work and go. There's so many distractions when you're out, you're in the sun, you might have a beach, you'll have a pool, you might have cafes, restaurants, you wanna explore, right? When you're outside of home, you wanna go and explore. Don't get too distracted. I think that's a big one. If you're trying to do something, get it done and then treat yourself to yeah, yeah. a beach day or a barbecue on the beach or whatever it is. Cause that, you do that really well. You don't get too like, oh, you know what? I've got two hours, but you're more like, no, I've got two hours. I'm going to get it done now. And then I can hang out yeah. with you guys. I'm like, well, that's where you get all the nomads in Bali. They're doing nothing. They're just sitting around drinking coconuts instead of actually doing the work. It's so easy that. to get distracted. Uh, and I think I was going to say, that's, that's a big one is just don't procrastinate because you're away and don't treat it just because you're away from home that you need to maximize where you are. Because if you're there for a month, you've got a month to absorb the area, not four days where you need to cram your diary with as many trips as possible because then you're going to get any work done. So you have to remember what you're there for and, and then operate accordingly. Yeah, I like that. Uh, anything else on that? No. I'd say just one more thing on the, on the idea of working away is or being away for longer than holidays. Every day starts to feel like the same, I think in a really good way. I think when you're at home, it can be easy to fall into that Monday to Friday routine and then it's Saturday and Sunday and then you're yeah. like Monday and Friday. Whereas here, I think it would feel like every day just feels sort of the same, which yeah. I, I, I really like. I also think when you're when you're away from home in the sun, you can think clearer. You can you have more space to think. Uh, just feel in a better mood as well. You don't have to you don't have to work hard to feel good. Like I feel like in in London in the winter, you have to work hard to feel good. You have to go mm -hmm. and make sure you get your steps in and train and do all these things. Whereas here, you will probably do that by default because it's it's sunny. Uh, whereas there, you're like you're playing speed. Oh, I need to do it at three p.m. because the sun goes out at four p.m. Like all yeah, that sort yeah. of stuff. Whereas yeah, you're here. You just do, you do steps because you want to go for a walk. Um, so I don't think you have to work hard to feel good. So there's a lot of benefits, I think. Okay, so final question. Uh, how has it changed since ESC has started eating? Are you all eating different things? What tips have you picked up so far? Is she vegan? Uh, you know, what, what, what's, the, what's the deal? These are some questions come in. So she tends to eat what we eat. So we give her, we have um, breakfast and lunch together and dinner she eats slightly earlier than us because she goes to sleep quite early. Um, so we, I just sit there and have fruit or a little snack with her while she's eating. So she always has meal times with us. She has the same pretty much breakfast as us, lunch as us, and we just adapt it accordingly. So she, if it's avocado on toast for us with scram uh, tofu scramble, she'll have the same thing. And then I try and change an ingredient. And um, when it comes to things like veganism, vegetarianism, or you know uh, what she eats. And um, we've decided to keep her vegetarian because I'm not fully vegan. I know you're fully vegan. But when I'm looking at more things to do with baby nutrition, I feel like I want to introduce her to certain allergens. So she eats egg, she eats dairy, but obviously no meat products, um, no meat, fish. Um, and, and I think that works well for her now. And then we can cut well, that back. Well, one of the reasons there. is it was also speaking to people who are vegan. And yeah, they were saying true. that they raise their babies, a lot of them raise their babies as vegetarian because... Yeah it's more, the actual reason is more around like when they are like three years old, four years old, they go to parties and they might be egg in the cake. It's like, are you gonna to say to them, well, there's egg in that cake, you have your own cake over there. I think it's quite isolating because they can't understand, or un yeah, they can't understand the difference at that point because you can't even see the egg, the egg is inside the cake. Um, so I think that was one of the, that's one of the probably the bigger reasons for this. The allergens one is, is definitely there, but I think another reason is just uh, as the aspect of the social element, and oh, then when yeah, she's old sure. enough, she can make a decision of whether she wants to add meat or fish. Probably not if she's around me. Yeah. Uh, or if she wants to go and just cut the, the dairy and dairy yeah. out. The, the, the social one's big because she's at that age now, and I've seen it with my nephew who's three, that they want to eat what you're eating. So if I'm eating chicken, let's just say, um, she might say, I want to, you know, I want to try that. And I'll be like, no, 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 you can't. So, and not just me, even if it's my parents or friends or wherever, if it's a party situation, if there is meat, fish, etc., on the table, she may be like, I want to try this. But she doesn't, she may not know what it is. Yeah, just but I think so meat young. is different. I think meat is different though, because you don't have to, I think you can, I think you can explain that a bit better. You can be like, well, that was a chicken who you saw yeah. in the reading book. And that's no longer a chicken as an example, right? I think yeah. that becomes a bit easier, but 
uh, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, lo- there's so many arguments thing. around this. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's many arguments around it. As you can probably tell, like we're still, we have slightly opposing views on this as well. I don't know about opposing. I think I, I, I will, we'll see how it goes. Is for now, yeah. like it's good. She just eats what's on her plate. She doesn't want to. When I say that, I'm more hardcore. Oh, yeah, you. Yeah. Like I'm more yeah, like, fine. right, I want it to go down this way. Yeah, yeah, Whereas yeah. you're more like, you're thinking more practically around it of like, yeah. what's the reality going to be? And the reality is probably more what you're saying as opposed to what I'm saying. Yeah. And then my, my reality is like, yeah, she should go vegan. She should be this, but I know it's not practical. Yeah. In many aspects. Well, we've spoken to parents, other parents, as you said, so that's that's helped us with how we kind of shaped what we didn't do. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that's pretty much all the questions. So we've got a couple of rapid fire questions here. Okay. Uh, TV or book? Book. It, it depends on the mood, but book. Yeah, I'd say the same. Yeah. Uh, although we, yeah. Although I haven't actually read a book in a while, but we've got Kindles now. Oh, Kindles. So we've got Kindles now. So excited to. I've got Elon Musk downloaded. And, and you've got, got the maid. maid. <laughs> but it says it all, doesn't it? I want to read about uh, hardcore business. I just love and fictional books. Fiction. I just get really into it. I get lost, lost in my own head. Uh, summer or winter? Summer. Yeah, I agree. I love the sun. Uh, morning or evening? I like morning. Yeah, I'm definitely a morning person. Yeah. For me, morning is, if we have a walk in there, that's, it's the best time. Oh, morning walk on Our the morning beach. walks here are amazing. Who needs more sleep? You. Yeah. I'm surprised as to how much sleep you need. You need like 15 hours or something ridiculous. No, no, no. I need, how I need much eight to nine hours. How many? Eight to nine hours. Okay. There's been times when you sleep 10 to 11. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I took away an alarm about three years ago. I tried to bring it in a few times because I think I can't be sleeping this much. Yeah. But every time I do it, I just stop it because two days in, I'll be feeling ill. So, and I get like, uh, it's obviously a privilege to not have an alarm. Yeah. Because I don't need to wake up at a specific time. So, for me, it's just a case of, if I don't need it, let me just roll with it. Especially now, I'll see her sleeping through the night. There's no reason for me to, to yeah. wake up. So it's not to say I'm sleeping in until nine o'clock. No. I'm usually no, up no. between six and seven. Yeah. Um, but I don't know when in that hour window I'll get up. So sometimes it'll be 6.15, sometimes it'll be seven, sometimes it'll be 7.15. Who always finishes their plate? You. And I finish yours as well. You do, if I have leftovers. <laughs> and uh, who's Sia's favorite? <laughs> I think she loves you, but I've got the goods. I've got the food. So she knows, like, you know what it is? She comes to me for food and then she comes to you for playtime. Yeah, so food and fun. I'm fun. Yeah. <laughs> okay, brilliant. I think that's everything. Uh, yeah, that's all the questions done. Okay. Smashed it.